Thank you all for coming. Can you hear me okay at this level? Okay. I think the repeated expressions of gratitude uh, from speakers in this podium makes evident how gratified we all are and how much we appreciate being part of this community of writers. Um, Adrian Heron and our workshop have been great. We've learned a lot. Um, I want to echo all my earlier thank yous to Wyatt and everybody who makes Swanee what it is. There's a Louisiana word, lanyap, that means a little something extra. And the connotations are of something extra sweet or extra special. This year I'm enjoying the lanyap of having here writers who have been among my blessings as a writer who teachers teaches. They were writers when I met them, not students. So I allow myself not pride in their success, but thankfulness that I got to be there when they were developing their talents. Bonnie, Emily, Jesse, Sharon, Tony, Trey, you all done good. <laughs> it's a privilege to read to all of the readers and writers in this audience. My daddy died when he was 57, and when I approached that age, I learned my mother was superstitiously terrified that I would die that year. She had me a little worried. Late night on my 58th birthday, actually the wee hours of the day after, my wife Donnie and I were just sitting together on the couch. I was a sipping, sipping a one to grow on extra scotch and extending my birthday privileges past the midnight hour, Donnie was tolerating some old country music. As Willie Nelson sang, the most unoriginal sin, a line from Dr. Seuss popped into my head. How did it get so late so soon? I was safely 58, not dead, and life was good. But later that night, I lay awake thinking about how imaginations can fail us and allow us to suffer unoriginal angst. As Willie says, you do it over and over again. I got up and went to my study and wrote down something that seemed worth writing down at 2.30 in the morning. I saw call such scribblings nocturnal emissions. <laughs> a year passed before I read in the Knoxville news about an event concerning a brown bear that somehow made images and ideas, emotion and intellect, cleave and that same afternoon, I wrote this story. With what felt to me like bravado, before I left my chair, I emailed the editor of Shenandoah, a magazine I'd admired but never submitted work to, and asked whether the spring semester having just ended, they were still reading manuscripts. The editor, Rod Smith, immediately replied, I'm in the office. Email it. I'll take a look. In the time it took for me to take a short walk and worry about the revisions I should have made before I sent it to him, I got an email from Rod saying he wanted it for the next issue. I mention this because I'm grateful when the editor of a literary magazine, all of them overworked and underpaid, takes the time to read my work. I have never before written, submitted, and had accepted in one afternoon any piece of work, and it will probably never happen again. <laughs> Last week, Tim mentioned a man awake at 2.30 in a sleeping house, and Jill talked about houses, doorways and windows, looking out of and into imagined lives from the house of fiction. In this story, a man is up at 2.30, and more than one door and window is stared out of and into. I have never read this story to an audience, unless you count the few minutes when I was writing a scene in which a dog appears, and our dog padded into my study, and I asked if he would give me his canine opinion. <laughs> the sweet dog sat and cocked his head, and I read the scene. This afternoon, I timed myself reading the entire story, and it took 52 minutes. So it's okay if you respond as the dog did. He lay down and snored. <laughs> Lisa Cupolo Bausch helped me choose this story to read, so 
I wrote a poem for her, and this reading is in her honor. For helping me to re-see, this reading is for Lee. <laughs> Late at night, early in the morning. Paul woke to his wife sitting up beside him in bed and yelling upstairs to their son, Jason, get off the phone now. The dark, quiet room amplified Anne's voice. The clock on the bedside table read 2.05. We told you 11, Anne yelled. Paul swung back the covers and got up, his bare feet pounding the bare hardwood floor. Anger carried him up the stairs, but as he crossed the landing, his wife screamed at their son again, and she sounded so shrill, he recoiled. Going down the carpeted hall towards Jason's room, Paul thought, what difference does it make, really? It's the last school night of the year. Jason will have no real assignments tomorrow, probably just sign yearbooks and have class parties. So what if he stays up late? all night even, talking to Cassidy. Paul was sure his son was talking to his girlfriend. Paul opened Jason's door. Lighted by the glow of the boy's computer screen, Jimi Hendrix's purple face stared down at Jason, who lay in a tangle of sheets and the feather comforter he slept under year long. The boy held one hand over the phone and scowled at his dad. What, Jason said. Paul felt his anger returning. Give me the phone. Why? Because I said so. Paul cringed at the cliche coming out of his mouth. Dad, tomorrow's the last day of school. What if we get an emergency call? I'm on my cell phone. Besides, we have call waiting. The phone, Paul held out his hand. At least let me say goodbye. Go ahead. Close the door. Paul closed the door and then felt foolish standing in the hall in his boxer shorts, waiting for the mumbling to stop. When he was in high school, they didn't have cell phones or call waiting. He remembered lying awake, waiting for his parents to go to sleep so he could call his girlfriend, Linda. Back then, they didn't even have cordless phones. The black rotary dial phone was in the hall in a built-in nook that houses had back then. The phone barely reached Paul's room. He used to slip the black cord that was not nearly long enough to reach his bed under the door he closed and leaned against. Linda, whose family was well off, had her own private line, a pink princess phone on her bedside table. The dial, she told him, lighted up when she lifted the receiver. They talked for hours and shared long silences, Linda's whispers coming to him across the distance between their houses. He remembered almost dozing off, wanting to go to sleep with Linda's lips against his ear. She seemed so close, he felt the warmth of her breathing. Paul, Anne called, what are you doing up there? I'm getting the phone. What's taking so long? He knocked once, opened Jason's door. Jason slapped the phone into Paul's hand as a relay runner slaps the baton into the hand of the next racer. Paul turned and felt as if he were starting his leg of the race. Behind him came Jason's heavy footfall. Why do you care if I'm on the phone? It's two in the morning. He stopped and his son almost walked into him. The boy was an inch taller than Paul. When had that happened? Below them, the entry hall was bathed in the amber wash of a neighborhood street light. Paul imagined they were inside a giant medicine bottle, the light yellowed by brown plastic. Dad, you know I don't sleep. I'll still be up. Now I just have to be up alone. It's too late at night to talk about this. He turned, but Jason stepped in front of him. For just an instant, he felt something like fear. The boy was young, strong, but what Paul feared was that they would ever come to blows. If that happened, 
What difference who won the fight? It's not fair, Jason said. Life's not fair. You want to ruin my life. You don't give a fuck about me. Watch your language. Fuck, shit, goddamn. They're just words. You said that. You said, God damn, is a kind of prayer, asking, asking God to damn something. <laughs> they are just words, Paul thought. He said, but you don't say them around people who would be offended or hurt, like your grandmama. I don't see grandmama in here. Do you see grandmama? You should go to law school. You would argue with a fence post. I'm just asking you guys to lighten up. Anne's nightgown floated up the stairs toward them, looking just like a cartoon ghost. Can't you ever just tell him no? We were talking, Paul said. That's the trouble with you. You let him talk you into anything. Paul held up the phone. I got it, see? That's the reason he's so difficult. You always give in. Here's the goddamn phone. I'm not giving in. Jesus Christ, you can't stand for me to have any fun, can you? Jason said to his mother. You, back to bed, he said, then louder. Now, Dad. Paul stared at his wife and tried to give her a look that communicated how angry he was, but that would not let Jason think his parents were divided. Mind your mother, he said, his voice quieter and calmer, a tone he hoped sounded absolute in its authority. Jesus, fuck, I have no life. Two more years and I'm out of here. I can't wait. Bed now, Paul said. Jason shook his head, went down the hall to his room and shut the door. It closed with a demure click that sounded more ominous in its finality than if the boy had slammed it. When had that started, him keeping the door shut? When he was younger, Jason wouldn't go to bed unless Paul read, read to him. And when Paul kissed him goodnight after just one more story, he asked his daddy to leave the door open so he could see the glow of the downstairs lamp and hear his parents' voices. Now, as soon as he got home from school, he went straight to his room and closed the door. He was self-contained in there. All those things Paul had bought the boy. A stereo, a TV with a VCR, his own computer, one of those video game boxes, an electric guitar, an amp, a cell phone. Now he seemed to love those things more than he loved his parents. With Paul and Ann, Jason was mostly silent, sullen when he did speak, a prisoner being interrogated but refusing to divulge anything more than name, rank, and serial number. But from behind those closed doors came plenty of noise, often the stereo and electric guitar at once, and behind all that, the drone of the television. Those times when he did his homework, he wore earphones to a portable CD player, the music so loud Paul could hear it when he knocked to get the boy for supper. The tinny music so loud Paul could hear it across the room. Imagine how loud in his son's ears. Jason seemed to be bursting with self-expression, but never in earshot of his parents. Maybe, Jason thought for the umpteenth time, I should not have bought any of those things. He imagined Jason forced to rely on his imagination and ingenuity, cutting a round hole in a cigar box stretching rubber band strings, fashioning a guitar. Maybe we should sell the house and get rid of all the crap we own. Simplify our lives, get back to the basics. Might draw us all close again. But we won't actually do anything like that. And even if we did, it's just a cliched notion. Simpler isn't necessarily better. Our troubles would follow us to a cabin without electricity, probably. In silence, Paul followed Anne back downstairs to their bedroom. She pulled back the covers and put one knee onto the mattress, her back to him. He blew out his breath, and she froze. Why does it always have to be me, she said. Here's the goddamn phone. He threw it onto the mattress harder than he meant to, and it bounced and hit her in the arm. 
He started to go to her to say he was sorry, but she turned and faced him, stopped him where he stood. Mind your mother, I'm always the heavy. No wonder he's like he is. Nothing is easy with him, and he hates me. He doesn't hate you. I have to be the parent because you're so busy being his pal. You say no without even thinking. It's your automatic response. No matter what he asks, you say no. He disobeyed, so a parent goes and gets the phone. You let him try to talk you out of it. He didn't talk me out of anything. We were talking. Hadn't there been a change in the boy's tone, a, a shift from the defensive to something more open? We might have actually talked if you hadn't stormed up screaming. I wasn't screaming. Ask the neighbors. Surprised by how furious he suddenly was, he screamed. Hey, Williamsons, what do you guys think? What about you, Holcomb? He pictured himself raising the window and shouting again. He wanted to show her how truly angry he was. Anne shook her head and got into bed. Slowly, as if everything were completely normal, she rolled onto her back and closed her eyes. She moved her arms and legs under the sheet like she was swimming the backstroke, then folded the sheet across her chest and folded her hands on top of the sheet like a dead person, he thought, and then felt guilty. I have got to get some sleep. I'll be a wreck tomorrow. She opened her eyes. Come to bed. He was a wreck now. How could she sleep? He wondered whether in the dark she could see him shake his head. Where are you going, she said. Away. Anywhere away from you. Paul... It's bad enough having one adolescent to deal with. Help me out, okay? He closed the bedroom door behind him, closed her in their room, just as their son was closed in the room upstairs. Then he regretted it, because he wanted her to hear him poling around the house, being unhappy. He stood in the entry hall and stared through the bevel glass of the double front doors. In the amber light, his bare legs looked tanned and healthy, looked like the legs of a younger man. But his chest was tight with pressure. No pain, just pressure, as if a great weight were pushing down on him, something like gravity doubled or tripled. No pain in his arm, no tingling, none of his usual hypochondria. He did not fear that he was having a heart attack, not a physiological heart attack, but he was having heart trouble. Across the street, a light came on in Dr. Holcomb's upstairs. Paul wondered if he and Anne had been loud enough to wake the neighbors. Dr. Holcomb always got up early for surgery, but not at 2.30. Maybe the doctor had an emergency. Paul felt his lips contort he was the one who had an emergency. He was surprised to taste the salt of tears. He wished Anne could see that he was crying. He walked through the dining room and down the hall, opened the laundry room door and stepped onto the cool tile floor, eased the door shut behind him. Overhead, a square moon glowed, the open laundry chute from Jason's fluorescent lit closet. In the corner of the laundry room, the dog's short tail thumped. Paul waved his hand, and Jackson was immediately pressing his muzzle against Paul's thigh. He knelt and stroked the dog's soft curls. Against Anne's wishes, Paul had bought a puppy when Jason was seven. Paul's old lab, crippled by hip dysplasia, could no longer romp. Exiled by Anne to the backyard and a basement room, the old dog slept away the last year of his life. Anne had grown up in the country. They always had dogs, but never inside, she said. She could not stand the shedding. But a boy needs a dog, Paul had insisted. A dog is a companion, a responsibility, a living creature to nurture and train. Hadn't he read that 
Children who were cruel to animals were more likely to grow up as criminals, psychopaths. Paul would never have thought he had owned a poodle. But when he had researched breeds looking for something that didn't shed and wasn't vicious, he had learned that standard poodles are smart and low-keyed, similar to labs and golden retrievers in personality. No little yapping dog, Jason weighed 60 pounds. Jackson weighed 60 pounds. Jason named him after Michael Jackson, though Paul told him he'd regret the choice. <laughs> they had the groomer clip the dog's hair short and even all over, never a poodle cut, so he looked more like an Airedale or some kind of sheepdog. Turned out Jackson was a little more aggressive than a lab or a golden, and he herded young Jason and nipped at his legs. Paul ended up housebreaking and training the dog. Jason rarely even spoke to Jackson. Paul wondered if ignoring a pet indicated criminal tendencies. <laughs> Music that sounded to Paul like a car chase in a movie, squealing, roaring, crashing, came down through the open laundry chute. Paul remembered the day the three of them had stood in the unfinished house, stepping between two-by-four framing, looking up through the wooden skeleton. Hey, Dad, Jason had said, my room's right over the washer and dryer. I can just drop my dirty clothes down. For a minute, none of them realized the obvious. The floor and ceiling hadn't been built. When Paul laughed and said Jason might have a hard time getting his socks through the floor, Ann suggested the laundry chute. Cool, Mom, Jason said. How long had it been since either of them had received that blessing? The builder's change order for adding the chute cost $140, by far the cheapest alteration of the blueprints they made, and it turned out one of the things they liked best about the new house. It made Paul think of Thomas Jefferson's invention of the dumbwaiter, the genuine pleasure in ingenuity. Anne was good at visualizing things. She had designed the house, and when they hired a draftsman to draw the blueprints, he suggested Anne draw the exteriors to save them money. She hadn't finished college, but Paul didn't know a more educated person. She was really a remarkable woman. She knew all kinds of things. Beyond that, she had incredible intuition and a kind of wisdom. When they moved into the new house, Dr. Holcomb and his wife, what was her name, Marie, had come over with some kind of potted plant. Later that night, after the Holcombs had shared a bottle of wine with them and gone home, Anne said, something's going on there. That is an unhappy woman. A month later, Marie, no, it was Claire, moved out. Anne ran into her at the grocery store, and she asked if Anne had seen Dr. Holcomb's girlfriend, a nurse 20 years younger. A few days later, Paul walked to the street for the morning paper, and the woman, she had straight, dark hair that fell to her waist, and she was barefoot in a shimmery green nightgown, no robe, was retrieving Dr. Holcomb's paper. She smiled and waved, and Paul understood why jealousy was often described as a pang. When Paul and Anne had decided to build, their friends had warned them, only half kidding, that house construction leads to divorce. But building had been great fun. The last time Paul could remember the three of them happy, doing something together. Then, about the time the sheetrock went up, Jason lost interest. He even said he wished they could stay in the small condo they had rented after they sold their old house. It's too big, he said of the new house. My friends will think we're rich. We're not rich, are we, Dad? Not in money, kiddo. That recently, it had felt true that they were rich in love. By the light of the ice dispenser and the new stainless steel refrigerator, Paul poured three fingers of Irish whiskey in a glass, 60 bucks a bottle, pot still whiskey, whatever that meant. 
He opened the freezer door to quietly get an ice cube, then thought to hell with it, and shut the freezer door and pressed his glass against the dispenser that loudly sprayed crushed ice into the whiskey. He carried his drink into the sunroom and looked out the three walls of windows into the tops of trees and the dark shapes of his neighbor's roofs. Overhead pulsed the muffled collisions of Jason's music. Paul had an impulse to go up, sit on the boy's bed, and see if they could talk everything out. Everything, the entire past couple of years. Maybe it was the mus music they let Paul listen to, Jason listen to. Paul had told him he had to be mature and eclectic, learn techniques from any musician he liked without embracing the vision. Now most of the boys' heroes were dead teenagers, the victims of overdoses. Just last week, Jason had come home wearing a silver stud in each ear and a rope necklace that sported a big ceramic Buddha. He was no longer a Christian, the boy declared. As near as Paul could calculate, Jason was having adult experiences four to six years sooner than Paul had. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, it all started in middle school now. <laughs> Paul had not questioned his faith until he became a philosophy major in college. The outdoor lights came on at Dr. Holcomb's, and the man stepped outside in his robe walking his little dog on a leash. Paul took a pull on his whiskey and sat on the arm of a wicker chair that tipped sideways with his weight, so he slid down onto the cushioned seat. He felt off balance, drugged. But the only drug he liked was alcohol. He had not smoked marijuana until after he and Anne married, and he hated the claustrophobic tunnel vision feeling it gave him. The only good thing about it had been sex. He and Anne were on a mattress on the basement floor of a Georgetown apartment spending the weekend with a pal of his who was a law clerk for some hotshot judge in D.C. Anne liked smoking weed. Her hair was long and straight then. Paul remembered exactly how it felt slipping over the palm of his hand and between his fingers. He could still smell its eucalyptus scent. When had she stopped using that shampoo? Back then, most of their friends already had children and complained about them all the time. Paul remembered parties in law school. A row of sleeping babies sat down behind the couch, each one in a molded plastic carrier that looked like a no-frills car seat and jokes about bringing them in like extra six-packs. He and Ann decided to wait. They didn't want to feel tied down as their child-rearing friends seemed to. Paul and Ann traveled, bought a Volvo station wagon in Sweden, and spent a year driving all over Europe, sleeping in back of the car. One night in England's Lake District, they closed down a local pub and walked out into a steady rain. Drunk on ale and each other, they held hands all the way back to the caravan, what the Brits called a campground. They parked the station wagon in a rented place. Anne's rain-soaked blouse clung to her like darker skin. She had to pee so badly she knelt in the road, still holding Paul's hand. Out of the shadows, a man in some kind of uniform came up to inquire about their business in the caravan. Paul held their registration card in the man's face and told him Anne was tying her shoe. He remembers her stream on the pavement louder than the rain, and behind it all, her giggling. The night after that, they were somewhere on the coast of Scotland, their Volvo the only car in a grassy field right against the ocean. The old couple who ran that caravan brought them fresh strawberries for breakfast, and the old man kept saying he had plenty of Berlin water, plenty of Berlin water like in the movies when a baby is born, Anne said. What do they do with all those clean sheets and the boiling water? Maybe, Paul thought, we should sell the house and move over there. It seemed likely life was simpler, that notion again, safer in some Scots village. 
Surely the culture was better. Jason would have friends who knew a little of their own history and who read books, who got outside on bicycles or even better, ponies. Then Paul thought of the young toughs in British movies, remembered the Cornish hoodlums after Dustin Hoffman and Straw Dogs, thought of bands like the Sex Pistols, remembered that village on the seacoast where he and Anne had slept on the beach, but pictured now among the storefront awnings a video rental shop. He had another swig of whiskey. Crap, he thought, is ubiquitous. Who was he kidding? He wasn't wallowing in these memories because he had a boy on the rocky road of adolescence. He was trying to assuage his own unhappiness. It wasn't Jason's fault. It wasn't even Anne's fault. They were growing old together, and it was not even close to how it sounded in a poem. They had waited to have children until they felt ready. They had just the one and they were older than most of his friend's parents. Too old? Paul sure couldn't picture this older Anne squatting down to pee in a rainstorm and giggling while he distracted a constable. Truth be told, she'd become less fun. She seldom wanted to have sex, and what seemed to him worse, she acted as if there were something wrong with him at his age to be ready all the time. She was going through menopause, and he wanted to be understanding. He bought a book, The Change. <laughs> he read it like a man on vacation in Paris reads a book on conversational French. <laughs> he was looking for helpful words and phrases, wanted to learn how to advance his cause. According to The Change, after menopause, many women, freed of the fear of pregnancy and with their children grown, fully embrace their sexuality for the first time. Like U-Haul on moving, the book tried to make old age sound like an adventure. <laughs> Her female friends, Anne announced, felt the same way she did about sex. He and Anne had been sitting on the couch against new throw pillows she had bought. They were talking. According to the pop psychologist, married couples could solve any problem and be joyously happy so long as they communicated. Paul sipped his drink. He and Anne talked too much and held each other too little. The new sofa pillows had irritated him, made him sad if he admitted it, her getting rid of pillows they'd had for years. You discuss our sex life with other women, he said. Come here. She'd put her arm around him and pulled him close. Ill at ease, he sat beneath the wing of her arm. Be with me, she said. I need you. But she did not mean be with me in the way he wanted her to mean. All she meant was right then on the couch. And he felt smothered under the warm weight of her arm pressed against the new pillows that were not as comfortable as the old ones. He was a fool to think passion could last. Everyone knew marriage was not like that. Time turned romance into something less intense but more solid. Love became deep friendship, something cozy like an old sweater. In spite of such commonly accepted wisdom, in spite of the routines of comedians and the gossip of Anne's girlfriends, Paul believed some older husbands and wives still pleasurably coupled. He took another pull on his drink, nothing but ice. He had no memory of drinking the whiskey. No taste of it remained. Above him, the music had stopped or at least paused, and the floor squeaked, the drawer slid and bumped. There was muffled laughter and applause from the television. Paul wondered what the boy did up there till all hours, wondered what channel the television was on, what was showing up there in his son's world. In the kitchen, Paul pushed the ice dispenser again just to make the loud noise. It pissed him off that Anne was sleeping. 
she was sleeping through their life. He was awake, Jason was awake. Hell, even Dr. Holcomb across the street was awake. What was the guy doing over there at 3 a.m.? Paul carried the bottle of Irish by its neck in one hand, his refilled glass in the other. On his way back to the sunroom, he knelt down, set the bottle on the floor, lifted the hinge sheet on the hall, seat on the hall tree, and reached down into the dark space. He fished around in the softness of wool mittens and caps and scarves until he found the coiled leather strap and pulled up the binoculars and something else that spilled out and fell onto an amber rectangle where the street light slanted through from the entry hall. A knit glove, Jason's when he was a toddler, a tiny dark star on the bare floor. Paul drew the wicker chair close to one of the sunroom windows and held the binoculars up to his eyes. He moved his head around until he found one of the two lighted windows in Dr. Holcomb's house. A man, his back to Paul, was leaning into a mirror, tying his necktie. Paul turned the focus knob, and Dr. Holcomb's face appeared in the mirror, his lips pursed. At first, Paul thought the doctor was puckering up to kiss his own reflection. But he was whistling. His face swaying with some tune Paul wished he could hear. Paul wondered if a rip, lip reader could tell what song a man was whistling. From Jason's room came the whine and mule of electric guitar and a high-pitched voice. Paul strained to understand the words. Something about a phone call for a tombstone, cocktails in the cemetery, Paul pictured Casper the Friendly Ghost sipping a martini. <laughs> if it had become this easy, maybe Jason could make it as a songwriter. <laughs> Seen through the binoculars, the movements of Dr. Holcomb's head and shoulders somehow matched the wailing guitar and the off-key voice. Lips still pursed, Dr. Holcomb stepped out of the window frame of light. Paul swung the binoculars slowly to the side and found the doctor in a more dimly lit window. Paul focused on the man's shape, leaned over what looked like a bed. The room brightened, and Paul saw the long, dark hair of the doctor's new girlfriend fanned out against a white pillowcase. She had risen up and switched on a bedside lamp, and her pale arm dropped from beneath the bright lampshade that spilled light down her bare torso. She was sleeping in the nude. Paul pressed forward until the binoculars clicked against the windowpane. The lovely young woman had one upthrust, pink nippled, perfect breast. Only one. Dr. Holcomb reached and put his hand on the space where the other breast was missing. The girl's arms locked around his neck and drew him down. Paul sat back and emptied his drink. Without the magnifying lenses, the couple was a single dark shape in the lighted window. Now he truly felt jealous, for he understood that more than predictable lust drew Dr. Holcomb to the woman. Paul did not wonder why a man would leave his wife for a woman who had lost a breast. He imagined the fierceness with which he could love a woman strong enough to beat cancer and to sit up naked in the light and draw you to her, to one perfect breast and to an empty and scarred space. He wondered why trouble seemed to make some people stronger. But the doctor's wife, his ex-wife, Claire, she would see no beauty in her husband's infidelity. Of her, too, Paul was jealous. She had a concrete wrong to be angry or cry about. He wished the angels he wrestled with would sock him in the hip bone, give him some visible wound. He wished he realized 
that he were someone else, and that thought made him feel very old and suddenly afraid. Dad, Jason's form was dark against the brightness, all 12 windows full of morning sun. The boy's backpack weighted down his shoulders. A horn honked. Dad, bye. Paul, Ann said from deep in the house, don't forget his lunch money. I'm covered, Dad. Did you sleep here? The whiskey bottle and the binoculars were gone. Paul hoped Ann and not the boy had put them away. He reached in his pocket and pulled out a bill, a 20, handed out to Jason who shook his head. All night in that chair, Jason said. Go on, you'll be late. Sorry about last night, Dad. I'm feeling the pressure of the end of the school year. Skedaddle, Ann said, just like she used to say when Jason was little. She stepped into the sunroom holding a steaming cup. Bye, Mom. See you, Dad. Paul nodded, took the cup of coffee Ann handed him, and held it in his palm until the heat really stung. She walked Jason to the door, and when she came back to the sunroom, she had her coffee and the newspaper. Rough night, she said. You were there, he said. Not as long as you were. She was looking outside and smiling, watching Jason go down the steps, Paul realized. The sun cast a small, dark ring on her hair, the shadow of the circular pull that hung from the window shade. She turned her smile on Paul and handed him the paper, keeping the section that had the day's crossword puzzle. Don't brood, she said. We're making up, he thought, just like that, night and day. He glanced at the front page. Israeli commandos had captured a suicide bomber before he detonated himself. A family of three died in a Detroit house fire. The president passed his annual physical with an A. On the other side of town, a woman had wakened to find a bear in her bedroom. The bear had come in through the screen door and was eating hand lotion from a tube on her dressing table. (laughs) She crawled under her bed and waited, terrified, until she heard the bear go into her kitchen and start banging around in her pantry. She slipped from under the bed, got her cordless phone, got back under the bed, and called 911. The police came and shot the bear with a tranquilizer. The woman had made several pies for a church bake sale, and the police speculated the bear smelled the pies through the screen door and walked right through it. An expert at the university said that it was highly unlikely that a brown bear would go inside a house. Wildlife authorities had driven the bear far up into the mountains to release him. Everyone said the woman put a human face on courage. (laughs) Anne looked up from her puzzle. I need a word for grassy field. Cemetery. She shook her head. Three letters. Lee, L-E-A, also spelled L-E-Y. The same meaning, both the same, field, meadow. Things aren't easy on purpose, right? She stared at the puzzle, moving her lips silently. In the shower, Paul turned the water as hot as he could stand it and let it beat on the back of his neck. How was it courageous for that woman to hide under her bed? At work, he didn't have much to say, but no one seemed to notice. When another attorney, Lena Archer, stopped by his office to pick up some depositions, he studied her long, thin frame, the veins and tendons down down her bare arm like grapevine on a tree limb, and he wondered what it would be like to lie naked against that lean, muscular body. When she unlatched her briefcase and put the papers in, He stared at the fine blonde hair over the top of her hand, the pale skin of her wrist. She said she had to run, and because he wanted to feel Lena's flesh, he extended his hand. 
While they briefly touched, he imagined he could feel the lines in her palm. He smiled as warmly as he knew how, but she glanced at the watch that hung loose like a bracelet on her other arm. He walked her to the door, leaning close to smell her perfume or shampoo, but all he smelled was coffee on her breath. Any bear, he thought, could find Lena's scent. He spent the afternoon looking over some precedents, not really reading them, but letting his eyes move over the words. He wondered if he could have an affair with Lena Archer. He had never had an affair, and he thought of all the women he knew, and he could not come up with even one likely candidate. He stayed in the office late enough for rush hour traffic to die down. The sun hadn't set yet, but he turned on his car lights so he could enjoy the green glow of his dashboard. Instead of taking the expressway west toward home, he headed north toward the neighborhood where the bear had gone into the woman's bedroom. The newspaper article had given the name of her street but not her address, and he drove slowly down the street for several blocks until he saw a ripped screen door leaned against the front of a house. He parked and walked up the sidewalk to the door. Though he knew the bear had been taken away, he watched for it anyway in the sunset shadows of trees and shrubs. He could not find a doorbell, so he knocked. He knocked and waited, knocked again. He wanted to ask the woman what it had been like the moment she opened her eyes and saw a bear at her dressing table. Had the big animal stood before the mirror on two legs or had it sat on the stool at the dressing table? Was there any lotion left in the plastic tube the bear had bitten into? Were the holes from its teeth as big as the woman's fingers? Did the lotion smell good enough to eat? If the woman would let him, Paul thought, he would like to taste the hand lotion. <laughs> would she think that was crazy? She came from between two holly bushes on the far side of the house and took a few steps onto the grass, but stopped while she was still 10 or 12 feet from him. You want to tell me what you're doing? Knocking? Uh, I'm just knocking. Paul still faced the door and had to look over his shoulder to see the woman. He felt as guilty as if he'd been caught trying to break in. They're not home, she said. You're not her? I'm not who? The woman looked around as if she were expecting someone to step out of the bushes behind her, someone or something. The woman who found the bear in her room. Steve took her to New Orleans. You a friend of theirs? New Orleans. To get away from bear nightmares and bear ghosts. Cocktails in the cemetery. The line from Jason's CD came to mind. I, I've never met them, Paul said. I read it in the newspaper. The reverse of Goldilocks, the bear in the human's house instead of her in the bear's house. The woman did not smile, but he kept talking. Do you know how long it took them to come shoot it? I, I wanted to ask, I don't know, what it was like lying there with the bear that close. The woman pursed her lips and made one hand into a fist. She opened her mouth to say something, then just shook her head. She turned away and disappeared into the darkness, gathering around the shrubs and under the eaves of the house. She was out of sight, but her voice rose from the shadows. Some people need to get a life. I'm sorry, Paul said to the yard and the bushes and the looming black roof. I didn't mean to disturb you. And he was sorry. She was right in a way. He had a life, but he didn't have the one he had planned on. Did anyone? The newspaper article never mentioned Steve, never mentioned the woman had a husband. Where were you, Steve, when the bear broke in? <laughs> Paul drove home, his car merging with hundreds of others, 
like a fish joining a great school of fishes and being carried along. His neighborhood was hilly, the streets intentionally narrow and twisting. In the near dark, the house looked good. With all the windows lighted up, it looked busy and somehow happy. Ann had done a great job with the design. He pulled into the garage and lowered the overhead door behind him. As soon as he stepped inside, the dog danced around him, rubbing his muzzle against Paul's legs, his tail moving so fast, Paul expected the animal's rear end to lift, helicoptered off the ground. Keeping his head under Paul's hand, Jackson walked with him through the mudroom and past the laundry room, heat and the floral scent of fabric softener in the air. The dryer was tumbling loudly, something thumping inside the hot metal drum. Jason's tennis shoes, Paul guessed. You're late, Anne said. Would you take him out? She kissed Paul's cheek as she handed him the leash. He snapped the leash to the ring on the dog's collar and went through the kitchen to the family room where he opened the patio doors and Jackson bolted outside. Just before Paul followed the dog out, Jason appeared on the second floor landing overlooking the room. Hey, Dad, I made a 90 on my world history exam, two points shy of an A. Isn't that great? An A would be great, Paul said, and then regretted it. This is Mr. Moyes' class, Dad. He's a fucking hard ass. Watch your language, he said. Jason grinned and started down the stairs. Paul gave a wave to the back of his son's head and followed Jackson out into the yard. Jackson hiked his leg and peed on the little dogwood tree Paul had planted the past Saturday. Then the dog sniffed all along the privacy fence down the side of the lot, stopping every few feet to mark his territory. It always amused dog, Paul when the dog empties his bladder but kept hiking his leg and peeing air. No dark stain on the fence, nothing. The dog snorted as if he were in on the joke. He lay down and rolled onto his back, wiggling in the grass and paddling air with all four feet. He lay still and looked up at Paul, his tongue lolling out one side of his mouth that seemed to be open in a wide grin. Live it up, Jackson, you're a cheap date. Jackson snorted again, then sneezed, still on his back. Paul turned toward his house. The back was mostly glass and with the lights on, it looked like a dollhouse with the back wall left open so you could reach in and rearrange the tiny furniture, put your dolls where you wanted them. Like watching a stage play, Paul watched Jason walk into the kitchen. Anne nodded to the refrigerator and Jason opened it and took out a big bowl. She waved him over to the cooktop beside her, lifted the lid from the large copper pot, and they both stared down. Their lips were moving, their faces blank. They appeared to be perfectly happy, though he could not tell for sure. He couldn't hear them, couldn't understand the word they were saying. He could see them, but they could not see him out here in the dark. He wondered what was cooking. He thought of a Sunday school lesson from years ago when he was a kid about Jason's age, the parable of the prodigal son who returned home after squandering his inheritance and his father ordered the fatted calf killed to celebrate. In the kitchen, Anne and Jason, wife and son, blurred as Paul's eyes filled with tears. Who wouldn't, he thought, celebrate that? Paul's heart had always gone out to the prodigal's brother, the good son who had never been given a party. The father pleaded with the good son to come inside and join the celebration. The father explained that he'd always been there for his son and that the return of his brother, the lost son, was cause for joy. And the story ended without saying whether the good son went in with his father or remained outside alone in the muddy field. For Paul, the prodigal's brother, forever watched from the darkness the dancing lamplight in the windows of his father's house.
Maybe that's how it had been for the bear, smelling all those sweet pie smells through the woman's screen door, wanting to join the bright, sweet scents. When yearning is strong enough, maybe it becomes prayer. Regret, Paul thought, is always prayer. What, does, what did it feel like when the tranquilizing barb struck fur and flesh? For the bear, surely it was no more than the prick of a thorn, a sting small and easy to endure. Paul wished the wildlife people would come shoot him with one of those darts and load his unconscious self onto a trailer and haul him off to some haven where he would wake in a grassy meadow, a lee, and feel turned loose. The big poodle sat patiently pressing his head against Paul's knee. He wiped his eyes, and when he stepped toward the house, Jackson ran ahead, pulling Paul along on the leash. He closed the door behind him and unhooked the dog. When Paul entered the kitchen, his wife and son looked up as if surprised, as if they had forgotten he was home. The boy lifted a glass of milk to his mouth and tipped his head back. I'm glad to see you two have made up, Paul said, and smiled. I wish you'd learn to let things go, Paul. Quit wallowing. Get out the silverware. She took the lid off the copper pot and lowered her lids to look down through the cloud of stream, steam that bearded her face. Jason lowered the empty glass from his mouth. A milk mustache covered his upper lip. He grabbed the gallon jug of milk and refilled the glass. One disguised by steam and one by milk, his wife and son looked unfamiliar. Each of them looked away from him. Paul felt uninvited, as if he had entered the house of strangers. But he took napkins and flatware, and he set a place for himself at the table and places for the two of them who lived here with him. <laughs>